competition's history was for five or ten minutes we would be, um, it was kind of like an, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't know how to describe it from a game point of view, but it was where we would have different scenarios that we responded to. It was like a create your own adventure sort of, mm -hmm. <laughs> only very, um, it, it was more educational I guess. And so we would uh, really understand on a first hand level because we were experiencing for that amount of time, you know, you're going to get sent off to this corner of the room if you, if you say a single bad thing about her and, and um, to represent kind of what it would be like to live under sort of government. But it was an amazing experience for me because it was uh, fun, but it was also meaningful because we, uh, you know, we saw how we could be in control for that little amount of time. And uh, that was how we learned a lot of history, actually, not just in imaginary countries, but when we were learning about Mexico. Uh, our teacher, Felisa, she was really into Mexican history. Um, so we learned about all the Mexican revolutionaries, which is a little unusual. That was kind of cool, though. And the way that we did that was, again, through that kind of game where we had different scenarios that were represented to us. Uh, and so, for instance, you know, this is the government in place. Do you agree with them? Are you siding with them or against them? And then as we went on, we would find out what would happen to us based on what had happened in the textbook, what was happening over history. And this works really well um, if you uh, want to teach about, at the elementary school level, obviously you don't have quite the, like, um, you're going to get arrested scenarios, but um, the, like, for instance, maybe being, um, I don't know, what, what time periods do you study, like, in... No, we're just doing anywhere from, gosh, I guess coming to the Americas and studying with the okay. Americas, basically that we don't So like the pilgrims. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, that would be a good one actually for a game like where kids get to be the pilgrims and how do you interact with the Native Americans maybe? Or what is your experience? Are you, um, so you might present different challenges. Like it's a cold winter and you don't have enough food, so what do you do? How are you going to, so maybe you, uh, and that's where maybe a Native American might come in and help like mm -hmm. the kind of Thanksgiving story. But, um, yeah, doing it in this game-like way instead of just saying, here's what you have to learn, let's take a test. I found that that was a really fun experience for me. When I did sixth grade, we did like, when we were doing Egypt, we did like Survivor Egypt, and that mm -hmm. ran all day. And we did science, we would take paper bags, and we would, you know, do the, we did a crest, and then we had, we would take names like Sphinx and mix up the letters, and that would be one group, and that would, the tag would hang, and their four desks were there. And then throughout the day, we would, you know, intertwine Egypt with math, we did, you know, instead of using 10, yeah, mm -hmm. and then we did it in, in science and the multiplication, and, and then at the end we took, everybody went and they made a, um, a, an Egyptian artifact, and we turned our room into, we had mummies and black lights and ice, and, wow. and it was awesome. I, I don't get to do sixth grade anymore. It's, it's a little harder for me to do that with third graders because they're not as intuitive, but that was my favorite. That sounds amazing. When you can get Sorry. it into the whole thing. Yeah, definitely. We just um, performed you raise since Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. So there was like the whole stabbing and everything? Oh, yes. Wow, nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I'm, oh, I'm, I'm, I should be saying that I sound very violent right now. But um, I find that, actually, I, uh, I go to an online school, but I was taking two classes at my local school last semester, and they were drama and cooking, and drama was awesome. But we, um, we didn't get to do that many, like, fighting. Well, we... Well, I hesitated just because of... You know, yeah, you get the people who time are time period we're in and all the violence. But yeah. um, you know, I kept trying to remind the kids this is what really happened back then. So yes. you know, and we were using plastic knives. <laughs> yeah, and I think that it's um it's valuable <laughs> so for students. Touch them. Because especially boys, I know that boys are having a hard time in a lot of classrooms because um I, and I'm not sure how much of the studies and everything I, I believe, but I guess boys are more sometimes a percentage. I know my dad is not into, like, he's always telling me I'm making overgeneralizations, but I know boys are more like, you know, kinesthetic learners and stuff. So um, I guess all the fighting scenes really do bring out that aspect. Um, but also a lot of girls really appreciate the chance to, like, you know, jump around, do that stuff. I know I, I did. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, I think with the... Um, you know, violence and plays and stuff, using it and making sure that kids understand, you know, obviously this isn't something you wouldn't do in real life, um, but I think most kids would understand that. I know um, some, some of my classmates in drama were just like during, we were doing an improvisation thing, three steps I think or something, and so they would always do these mock fighting scenes where they were just rough out, aside from certain people. So back on top, sorry, history, uh, interactive games, great way to do it. Uh, having this sort of um, a cross between, this, so you present different scenarios that might have actually happened, like say uh, Irish potato famine. So your potatoes haven't, 
happened here. Um, and then what are you going to do? Uh, here's the different situations, here are your challenges. And then based on the student's reaction, the choices that they make, um, I, I find that that would be a really fun one to do. And that way you have this combination of the textbook learning, so these are the events that have happened, these are people's reactions to them and what happened to them, but you do it in a way that really makes the student part of the scenario. And since you guys teach the grade and not like separate subjects, then you could have, I think, more tie-ins like with history and writing. If students wanted to write from the point of view of somebody that they were learning about, uh, that would be really fun as well. And maybe if you wrote from the point of view of someone you were learning about and then acted that out or that factored into learning about history, that would be cool. Mm -hmm. So any, uh, so writing, history, I'm not qualified to speak on science and math at all. I, I'm, I, uh, even at the elementary school level, I would uh, not be super confident like teaching about that. But what? <laughs> <laughs> no, what? You're, under, you're too modest about it. I, you just don't have the confidence, but that no, doesn't mean you... I'm, I'm okay with like, I'm really bad with uh, the stuff that's actually taught at elementary school level, like with the, isn't it elementary school? You learn like pints and quarts and mm -hmm. uh, units of measurement, yeah. always, uh, yeah, really bad at that. Um, but algebra, like the equations that I'm a little better at, which is kind of weird, but mm -hmm. that's the way it works, I guess. Any so, question inside? Any questions? I have a question yes. as far as how come it's easier for you? What did, what did you do, how did you make it so that it's easier for you to learn? I mean, was there a way that you went about approaching math that made it a little easier for you? Well, um, at this level, I think the reason I'm better at middle and high school math is because I'm fine with it now and I actually kind of enjoy doing something. When I was five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, I was, I hate math. I would sit so at my maybe? worksheet. <laughs> yeah, my attitude. So that might be why I'm not so great with units of measurements and even <laughs> fractions and negative numbers. I can numbers, say something. Just it's just the time you didn't spend. We, as that's parent, true as well. I didn't. Well, my mom didn't yeah. learn that much math when she was growing up. I won't tell the whole <laughs> detailed story. Yeah, the, the story is that I gave up too early on my math and I didn't really focus on Adora's sure. math because you got to spend the time. Because she enjoys writing so much and I just let her go with mm -hmm. yeah. and reading, writing and you know travel around the world and, and um, uh, now she's spending more time. So I have to spend her, like three hours on one math yes. lesson sometimes because it's just that. I did and the also same thing with my kids for yeah. the same reason. Right, she's mm -hmm. doing ninth grade math which is more challenging than her age. Well, I mean, you're 13. I skipped, you're, I skipped yeah. two grades, so I'm in ninth grade. I'm taking algebra, and al actually algebra in ninth grade is not advanced at all for a ninth grader, but um, algebra for a seventh grader, which is the grade I would be, is a little advanced, mm -hmm. so I guess that's part of it. And then uh, combined with your modesty, which is a great, you know, No, not at all. You've not seen my <laughs> you just have to spend more time, and not everybody yeah, is good yeah. at everything, um, naturally. But a lot of it's not your passion. Exactly. Your passion is right. right. I'm not planning on being a mathematician, but at the same time, I, mean, I see the usefulness of math. Right. I actually wanted to be an architect for like a couple of years when I was... Until you find out about That it involved math. math. <laughs> yes. And actually, and my parents could have really capitalized on me wanting to be an architect. I, um, and the reason it was was because my teacher at the time was a uh, university student who was studying to become an architect, so I was very inspired. Mm -hmm. um, but if they had said, okay, we're going to take something that you really like, architecture and buildings, and let's see how math plays into this. I think they actually could have gotten me maybe more interested, but I, uh, it was sort of a fleeting. You still got time. So the joke the is, you know, what career Adora ended up choosing would be surprising me. W mm -hmm. What are they? Workout instructor, because I cannot stand those workout videos. It's like, step to the right. <laughs> but you're actually good. Um, you're yeah, I can do a really <laughs> funny parody of them, but I, I think that's the most unlikely. And then singer, because I don't play an instrument. My voice is pretty bad when I try to imitate songs. So, um, But my sister, and my older sister, Adriana, is a really good example of how kids diversify our interests, even in the same family, because she writes poetry, but her poetry is totally different. It's free verse. Mine is very, I love structure and everything. So um, that's, uh, but showing kids, when I talk uh, to students about poetry, I ask what makes a poem a poem? When you look at a piece of paper, what makes it a poem? And someone said, oh, it has to rhyme. And I said, no, that's not true. Like I write mostly rhyme poetry, but if you go to, they had dancing fingers on hand. So I said, if you go to the back of the book, you'll see my sister's poems and they're very free verse. They're very creative. Um, so by working in your classroom, you probably have students who are interested in all kinds of different things. So by using each person's interest to 
uh, an advantage. So for instance, with reading, uh, students who don't like to read, I say, well, what do you like to do? And if it's, uh, I don't know, <laughs> skateboard, then they can pick up a book about skateboarding or about a character who likes to do that. Uh, there's always someone or something that you can relate to usually in books. Any other questions? Okay, well, I know that I haven't covered science and math as far as on the creative side, but I think that, uh, I think the important thing to remember with science and math is that we often look at those as very non-creative things because it is a lot of memorizing you have to do your multiplication tables. But uh, one of the things I loved to do was write word problems that were very creative and I would write word problems for myself with multiplication or something and that would get me interested and in order to write the word problem I had to understand the concept so kind of mixing up a little bit having your students write word problems and say okay um, you, you want to cover what we've learned about why don't you write some word problems and you would obviously want to check them to make sure that they uh, work but then maybe passing them around and that could be fun as a creative way to tie in writing and math. Yeah. Another thing we did is uh, have a student actually design their own test kit they have to understand mm -hmm. what you're trying to test somebody because as a teacher, you write tests, you have all this idea behind mm -hmm. it, but students don't always necessarily know what you're right. trying. So have them reverse that, have them write a test kit. Mm -hmm. That's very fun. Another thing that I know, um, I've read a few education books that say that students who, and I'm guilty of this, but a lot of times we say you're good at this, not so much at that, you're really smart, um, but those are apparently words that make students feel like you're uh, your knowledge is set and that you can't progress. Um, the, I guess the, the study was that students who were told um, your brain continually adds new knowledge and your brain can really grow, uh, who learned that and you're working hard versus you're really smart, that they had, were more in this progressive mindset versus those who were told, oh, you're really smart, you're really good at this, were thinking, oh, I'm just good at this, naturally born that way. And I, because I'm not doing this well because I'm not born that way, when really it's about hard work, I guess. So emphasizing that no matter, and that's what's helped me with math, is uh, that I realize the reason I'm better at writing. It's partially because I'm really into it, but also because I'm working very hard at it. So if I apply the same mm -hmm. thinking to other subjects. Mm -hmm. And uh, that way students don't have the excuse of I'm really stupid, which I hear a lot of students say all the time, if they don't want to do something, I hate math, I'm too dumb for this. Mm -hmm. Using those kinds of excuses, if you knock those out of the way by saying anybody can do this, your brain is continually you know, adding knowledge, then I think that really helps students understand their own learning process. Mm -hmm. And gets into the, the self-talk, you know, mm -hmm. yourself kind of self-talk. Yep. Yep. Have you ever tried to do something with a group of students that you found out was too hard for them? Or yeah. I how do you deal with that in the midst of your lesson or your project? What do you do? Well, because I'm really gung-ho about writing, so a lot of times I have to remind myself, this is a group of students, even though I was writing all these short stories at seven, I can't expect the same of everyone. Um, so I have to slow down sometimes. Uh, my hardest one was when I taught, so I designed this presentation called Response to Literature about uh, you know, writing responses to literature for um, high school students, so more like 9th through 12th. Mm -hmm. The class I was supposed to teach it to was fourth grade. That was the hardest one because I realized that uh, these students did not have much experience writing essays. They had maybe just started personal narrative. Their writing itself was maybe needing work and I was about to ask them to write like four pages uh, of writing in response to a book. So that I had to slow down and start by asking really simple questions. What is your favorite book? What do you like about the book? It's good. Okay, how can we add details to that? What made it good? Um, but even then, by asking all these supporting questions, I found that some of them still didn't quite get why are we writing this, you know, what is it going to look like? So I had to definitely um, give more examples, ask more questions. Mm -hmm. But because I started so young with reading and writing, I guess I was on a slightly accelerated, um, and also because my mom was running this after school program, we had tutors who were really customizing what we were learning to what we knew. So I was, I guess, uh, reading apparently the textbook that we were using for American literature was actually like a 10th grade level one and this was when I was I don't know nine so it was I guess I when I'm talking to students who are nine years old I don't want to compare them to myself at nine but I try to have high expectations as well and if they don't meet those expectations initially then I just you know add different questions or uh, examples mm -hmm. And uh, anything else? Oh, and by the way, um, before the session's over, I need to remember to pass out all the 
teaching or collaborative, um, you know, the teacher involving, or the teacher getting involved in the student's writing, and, yep. and, and basically you're encouraging teachers to show students steps from the idea to writing, is that right? Yes, Anna? because students a lot of times don't have the chance to see the writing process happen, and that's a really important step. Um, because if you're solving a math problem, you know, you want to see how does this get solved. And it's the same with writing. And again, what are some of the steps that uh, it's helpful to show the students? Well, you know? really starting from an idea, so choosing between two different flavors of ice cream, and then going to the finished product by saying, how do we make it interesting? You might start writing, you might say, here's what I'm going to talk about first, second, so possibly making an outline. I know a lot of students have difficulty with that. Not so important for if it's a short, uh, it's a very short thing, but um, maybe organizing and then writing it. How uh, how do I revise as I'm going? Does this sound good? What words might I, words might I use instead? Uh, asking students questions and that really helps. And um, again, the the personal narrative. Um, uh, how now? You said that kids really enjoy telling stories verbally, mm -hmm. but sometimes they think their life is so boring that they can't write something. And again, mm -hmm. what are the steps that a teacher can use to um, encourage a student to write an interesting, you know, make that lead to an interesting story on paper? I think uh, by asking questions, so maybe directing it, like tell us about a time you're writing, getting students to raise their hands and just say it verbally first. You uh, mean, uh, you mean it, it, telling the story verbally, getting a Maybe story. not necessarily the whole story, but just saying, uh, oh, when I um, when I uh, took my bike to, uh, I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, OK, so for instance, maybe at the time I was brave, when I rode my bike all the way down a big hill, uh, you might just say it like that and then expand on the idea. So starting by asking you, can you tell us quickly what your idea is in a sentence or a couple of words? So riding my bike down a big hill, that was the time I was brave. Then the teacher might ask, well, how can we expand on that? What were some details? How do you feel? So by asking questions, and at this point, maybe uh, I would go up to the keyboard and I would start typing. I would type the idea, rode my bike down a big hill, and then I would add some descriptive words. So if the student said I felt scared, I would add scared, and then we would begin writing it. So I think uh, starting out by getting this idea, maybe asking for some details or some descriptive words, and then how do we make this more exciting, and really writing it with the students. And again, um, actually writing it out like you did, so yes. showing that you showing know, just showing actually writing and, and it's on mystery. Yes, it's not, yes. Yeah. It's what I like to call the poison tester approach because so many kids they have this very um, fearful, it's kind of uh, you know approach to writing. So by testing the poison, okay, not saying writing is poisonous or anything, but um, teachers, by putting yourself in that vulnerable position where students see that you might even have the occasional thing with how do I make this sentence sound better, uh, that, that makes it so much easier for them because then they don't feel bad. I don't have an idea. Well, the teacher is thinking of an idea right now. She, she takes a little time too, so it's okay for me to do that. And any, any other examples of technology? You're talking about the blog and the, uh, um, well, the chat rooms. You were talking about chat rooms. Can you set up a chat room with students and, and you know, and just and get them? And you said that that really helps kids learn how to type. Is that or is that? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that you can uh, set up, like you can just set up a private chat room uh, with students to have them chat with each other, type, try typing fast. Um, online, you remember, your online school, you have the game. Jeopardy, you have to type your answer really quickly, remember? Yes, um, when I was in eighth grade, we had History Jeopardy, and it was a live session. We would go into the virtual room. It was like an Illuminate session. I don't know if any of you have had experience with that. Um, and so then the way it worked was we had a whiteboard that had the presentation, the Jeopardy questions, and the chat. And whoever sent in the answer the fastest would be uh, given the points for the question. And of course, um, I had a bit of an unfair advantage because I, at the time, I typed it 110 words per minute if I wanted to. So. 
I, if I knew the answer, I would just read really, I also read really quickly. So what happened is I would sometimes not send in my answer because I realized that somebody else should have a turn. <laughs> but um, I, and sometimes I did get beaten by people actually at school. But actually that kind of, that high pressure uh, can be used for a good thing. Sometimes it turns people off the high pressure. You have to solve that question really quickly. It just freezes up your mind. But when it's typing and when it's fun and not necessarily um, really high consequences, then it makes it better. And again, any other reasons why you prefer real books over an iPad or a book? Or? I think more, uh, it's more of a vision thing, I guess, because I wear glasses and I use the computer a lot. I'm sort of tired of having a backlit screen. So maybe Kindle's better, I don't know. But also the um, the way the pages turn, If because I read pretty quickly, then and I... Clunk, clunky to yeah, and I turn back. the pages, yeah. And I like to, I do like to flip back. But you can't, with an iPad, you can't stick your thumb at page 140, go flip ahead to somewhere in 160, flip back to 140 and say, oh, that's, you, know, you can't do that with the pull, mm -hmm. sticking your finger at a page. a bit because I don't have so much time for writing when I'm doing the lessons and the conferences. I'm hoping to, I'm, I'm working on organizing my event, TEDx Redmond, the youth conference is only the second year. Um, and what is, what is that? TEDx Redmond, it's a T E D uh, X letter X, Redmond, R-E-D-M-O-N-D. -E and it's a youth conference and it's organized, we have an organizing committee of 14 people all under 18, um, a lot of my friends and um, people at junior high and high school, and um, we have, all of our speakers are going to be, well actually all but one of our speakers I think will be 18 or under, and then one is 19. That's going to be this okay. summer. Yeah, uh, actually sorry, September, September 10th. And okay. everybody else can watch. Yes, and there's a webcast, and so for those of you in Montana or if you have students who might be interested in watching, or kids, or anyone you know, please tell them about TEDx Redmond. Also, if you know any companies that we would like to <laughs> sponsor, you that would be awesome. But. Um, that's our biggest challenge right now. Yesterday, uh, not yesterday, last year, we thought we would have an issue getting attendees. The night before the event, we ended up getting 750 people signed up, which made me have a heart attack because we were aiming for 100. <laughs> and then, uh, so this year, our problem is sponsors, and hopefully next year we won't have any issues. Oh, you're going to have issues always. Yeah, <laughs> my mom's outlook on this. And what kinds of things are you planning to write? Do you uh, do like fiction, or do what kinds of things? I'm hoping to write a novel, but I don't know if I'm giving myself enough time for that. Uh, probably a lot of short stories. Short stories are always my uh, favorite area because um, I don't know why I like short stories. I guess I just... You want to get it down quickly. Yeah, I get, I get them done quickly. It's very instant gratification. And also, my problem is that I lose interest in what I'm writing. Or not lose interest, but I have a new idea come up very quickly. So short stories let me write something and then have another thing. Uh, poems as well. Poems are also the ultimate when it comes to writing them quickly. Maybe put a, um, your speeches together as a presentation book to help possibly, students? Possibly, Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of maybe uh, writing a book helps students with giving presentations, giving speeches, because I know a lot of kids are interested in public speaking. But I would be kind of flattering myself to say that my speeches are role models of excellence, because I know that many people have given better speeches. So that's but you, my, you're comfortable about speaking. Like yes, right? and so a book that would help young people, especially do public speaking, I think might be valuable where they could see speeches that are written by their peers or examples of uh, speeches given by other young people. I think that would be valuable. Mm -hmm. Really, there isn't any examples out there. Mm -hmm. All the speeches done by adults and you know kids actually learn a lot by writing speeches and their ideas present to the world. Yeah, there isn't any examples. That's another thing actually with history is that if you um, to make it interactive, having like a debate that's but where people might, so maybe one person is, I don't know, I'm trying to think of someone like uh, Lincoln, and maybe another person is, uh, oh, what's his name? The person who's running, oh, goodness, I really need to review that period of time. But okay, so a debate between Lincoln and Douglas? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. So um, yeah, having a debate or something where students again really get into that. Mm -hmm. I just thought Then what happens when you uh, are in high school or you're in college and you have to do research and you come on a site 
and you don't know that it, because it, it's a dot com and maybe it's by an organization that's not trustworthy, how do you know how to pick out what's good and what's bad? So I teach a, less, um, a program called Digital Citizenship and another one called Web Detective, where we go to various websites that are fake or that are distributing uh, untrue information. So like a good one is uh, all about explorers com. So, and actually this is fun. What you, um, if you want to teach your students how to identify uh, a good website versus a bad website, um, or hoax information, allaboutexplorers.com. It's very nicely designed, it looks nice, so go to Explorers A to Z. So tell them, okay, let's find everything that we can, uh, find out everything we can about Christopher Columbus. Okay, so that's Christopher Columbus. Christopher Columbus was born in 1951 in Sydney, Australia. <laughs> His home was on the sea. So already in that first sentence, most of us who know about Christopher Columbus knows. Well, let's say you are um, seven years old. You haven't read that much about Christopher Columbus. You know he's a famous explorer, and you know that he did lots of traveling, and maybe that's about as much as you know. So you would read this, and you would think, okay. Well, when I talk about those high school students, they usually identify 1951. That's not true. Let's say you don't know that much about Christopher Columbus. Then what you do is you notice something that's logically wrong. Christopher Columbus was born in 1951. In 1942, he set sail with three ships. Can people set sail before they're born in three ships? <laughs> so even if the student doesn't know how much about Christopher Columbus, they should be able to figure out that if you're born in 1951, you can't sail in 1942. And by the way, Christopher Columbus is really old, and that's not that old. So. Uh, that's a good one. And then also, if you're wondering who would make this kind of malicious website, of course it was developed by a group of teachers as a means of teaching students about the internet. So it's uh, it's not like being evil, it's just um, used as a good uh, tool for when you're learning about the internet. So walking with student, walking students through websites that maybe look trustworthy, like All About Explorers, and the great thing is that this one is appropriate for elementary school kids. There are some websites that can be used with high schoolers, but that are more edgy, that are uh, untrue. Those are more like propaganda or, you know, let's look at this organizations. But those might not be so great for elementary school. This one's very good uh, for elementary school or uh, middle school. So that's a good uh, resource. Yeah, CILC.org. And this is a uh, really very comprehensive place with content providers. And another thing is that it allows you to see what has been requested a lot, what has gotten a good evaluation. So for instance, if you see this little sign, I think I got an award. I'm a CILC Pinnacle Award winner, which is kind of cool. And this one, a lot of people have rated it well. Um, and that one as well. So yeah, you can find all these different programs. There's a lot of writing. There's a lot of math. Uh, there's also a lot of content. Uh, from zoos or museums. If you search, uh, let's say zoo, I think there should be quite a few. So there's Buffalo Zoo, Toledo Zoo, Bronx Zoo, Indianapolis Zoo, Zoo Conservation, Zoo Clues, I to work the zoo, all these different <laughs> things just on this one topic. So great if you, you know, teach you about animals or an aquarium, they have aquariums as well. So all kinds of different virtual field trips, experts, classes that are offered as well. So CILC.org is great for content. Uh, over Skype. It's primarily video conferencing, but I think everyone who does video conferencing can also do Skype things. So, so for instance, I'm going to write my name, and then I'm going to, so we do sort of write uh, our script here. Uh, no, actually, uh, okay, I'm going to do a kind of high school intro, romantic poets. And then over here I might put modernist poets. And then I could have a frame like this. I'm just experimenting here so it might not look great. And then another frame like that. And I would, well, I might make this actually with the students. And uh, so then I would have, I might zoom in quite a bit. Wait, words were. What I could do, I'm just quickly this. So uh, start off here, then to this frame, to here, here, to here, and there. And what this is going to look like is to start at Dorsita, romantic poets, zoom in, words were, keeps, 
Honors poets, and I might do like William Butler Yeats. So when you insert text like your your videos, <laughs> what do you insert? Just the, you just hit the insert button, and then you, you just double click. Actually, yeah, double click. And then you put your URL, or you put your. You can yes, you can put URLs. And another thing is but yours you were already loaded. How did you do that? <laughs> oh, mine were already loaded. You mean yeah, when you when you went to your videos, you just all you had to do was play, right? Oh, oh, I see. Well. They're not actually videos quite, um, yeah, they're not technically videos, but they're already loaded because I made these and I saved them. So when you make, when you make Prezi's, then you just But when them. you insert that, do you insert it as an insert when, in your Prezi? Oh, uh, making a new Prezi or? No, your video clips. Show me how you put your video clips oh, in your Prezi. Oh, video clip in the Prezi. Oh, okay. sorry. Okay, here we go. Uh, well, you can embed YouTube videos directly just by inserting the URL. So you just you click or, the insert there. Is that how you do that? Yeah. Um, so what you do is you just insert YouTube. Okay. And if it's not a YouTube video, I think you can do it. As you a can do a load file. file like from a yeah. maybe your yeah. Okay. Um, I'm Super. not sure if it works with all video formats, but uh, I'm yeah, I'm pretty sure it should work too. So Got and it. then you just go through, and that's why I have all my videos directly. Okay. So it's really useful. It's good for, I found it's really good for if you have something big, so for instance, romantic poets, and then you have the small text, you'll go from this big and it'll zoom in all around, which is quite nice. So uh, that's very useful. Prezi is a, uh, a huge thing I am a fan of, and this shouldn't be, I don't think this should be an issue for filters because it doesn't have ads. So uh, that should be good. And then other things, um, another good one, do any of these Animoto? Sorry, I should turn it on. Um, well, Animoto is a very interactive uh, slideshow one. So if you're, um, I think this, I'm trying to think of what subjects this would be really good for. This would be good if you want to have an introduction or an overview to a unit. So for instance, if you're talking, if your unit is uh, Revolutionary War, you might make a really quick uh, 30 second, one minute video that had some really compelling pictures, really drum beat kind of battle sound music, and uh, you could narrate over it, I think, uh, as you're showing it, or you could just show it to the students and ask what they think. So they should have a thing about education where they have examples. Uh, and oh, and it's free for educators. So that's cool. Can you burn a DVD from that? Yes, you can burn a DVD. You can put it on YouTube. You can download it as a video. You can uh, make, actually I used it when I was doing my National History Video documentary. I used Animoto for the introduction and the conclusion. That was really dramatic. So this is like what one might put to the outfit. Cool. Um, so this one's for the alphabet and all these which made different things. And if you're doing this, you might have to see how fast they could shout out what the letter was. So L, M, you know, and see how fast they could do it based on the music. Um, so Animoto is great for these introductions to the alphabet. It's good for an overview of a topic. It's good for uh, anything that's visual. Like for instance, if you were, I'm trying to be a like science, if you're trying to say, here's uh, spiders versus or bugs, or something <coughs> like that, okay, chemical symbols, yeah. Yeah, elements. Oh, that's a really good one. So elements. Yes. Actually, and if you had this and you had it going pretty fast, and you could see how fast the students would shout out what it was, yeah. they could kind of like a game to beat the music or beat the how fast it switches. That would be cool. That's an example of a good one. Uh, and then this is a more history. For people to join in, I know that they're looking for a lot of teachers to uh, spark this discussion about how videos and how creative uh, platforms can be used to spread learning. And the great thing about TED, uh, the TED website, and by the way, that's education.ted.com, is that they have videos really from all kinds of experts. Uh, Bill Gates has talked there, and um, Al Gore has talked there, and um, I talked there, which is pretty awesome. The most wonderful thing about TED and TED is that the speakers are never more important than the audience. I felt like the most important person there, for sure, uh, because in the audience, actually going, going after me was James Cameron, director of Avatar, which was just totally surreal. I um, felt really bad because I was asking everybody for pictures. But the next year, they actually said on stage, please don't ask anybody for pictures. I think it might have been inspired by the fact that it was paparazzi of Ted. Um, but it's, 
aside from the sheer star power of everybody who's there, it's also a uh, wonderful fact that it's posted on the TED website and that the video has such an impact because a lot of people found out about me through TED. And that was, uh, yeah, really wonderful. So this is a wonderful learning resource. If you are teaching about something having to do with science, they have a lot of wonderful science videos, math videos, and adults videos, all kinds of things. Kiran Giuseppe, who's uh, I can video I showed earlier, also from TED. So they, uh, and you can, they uh, have this range, so if you're looking for things with science videos, you can have all this. Uh, and um, yeah, they have some wonderful things. So TED is a wonderful resource. Uh, then TEDx events are independently organized TED events. And TEDx Redmond is organized by you for youth users and teachers from last year. And we have 750 people attend. We are uh, launching it. We have no sponsors so far, but uh, we're going to go ahead and run it outside if we have to. And um, yeah, so it's, uh, and also we got to um, our speakers last year. Um, our speakers last year, um, we had Jordan Romero, the youngest person to climb Mount Everest. And Jessica Markowitz found a charity to help girls who want to go to school. Jason Neal, entrepreneur, can pull out to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars for cancer research, all kinds of really incredible young people. And there's just such a wealth of kids my age who are doing right things that we were able to fly them in or, or um, bring them in locally uh, to come speak at the conference. So if you have no students or if you'd like to watch the webcast, we're going to be streaming it as well. And I'm sorry. And uh, now that you know about TED, and you might want to look into these TEDx events and think about how you could get the students in your school to run an event. It could be a TEDx event, so an independently organized TED event, or it could be any kind of event, really. It could be a benefit concert or a, something like that, where students really feel like we're doing something, we're pulling this off, we're running an event. Uh, running an event is extremely empowering, and you learn a lot. How to, actually some skills I've learned uh, sound really creepy when I say them out loud, but how to look up people's phone numbers and addresses when they'd rather you not contact them <laughs> asking for sponsorship. Um, probably not as essential for a little bit, but um, I, I have learned a lot. How to write good emails. Wonderful for persuasive writing. I have gotten s such an edge on my persuasive writing now that I have to ask people to help us fly in speakers. <laughs> and uh, even writing the speakers, being polite and communicating efficiently and answering emails. Uh, a lot of typing, a lot of website updating, taking their pictures, how to promote an event. These are skills which I'm sure you could somehow apply as standards. Persuasive writing, you know, is probably a writing standard. I don't know if elementary school, but or upper grades. So, um, and it doesn't have to be like a conference. I remember that in the video that I showed from Edutopia, they turned the funeral of the class praying mantis into something that taught writing. And so these things like the funeral of the bug or uh, praying mantis is, yeah, I guess that's what, um, uh, these seemingly ordinary things that teach not only these uh, real world skills, but also state, they apply to state standards. I think that's really the uh, great, um, really what, what we're aiming for. So uh, TEDx Redmond, there's going to be a webcast, lots of inspirational students, and also if you want to check out the videos from last year, there's some wonderful ones that have to do with education. So our first thing was uh, on education, so we heard from Priya about creativity in school and that, you know, uh, elementary experiences. She was talking about uh, gross cafeteria lunches and how sad she was that her favorite teacher had gotten laid off and a few other things. Uh, so very representative of how like decisions made at the top are impacting those down at the bottom. And then uh, Zoe on this is the one I can show this audio that she saw um, on how she wished that she could have more impact and effect and purpose within her classroom. So uh, th those are the presentations on uh, education and then also some on creativity, on movies and preserving. And uh, actually this was a really good one. Hill Beekenbaugh talked about preserving his Native American heritage in Washington State by doing work with languages. He told a really interesting story at the beginning. Um, and that was a great video. Maya talked about uh, body image, young girls, bullying. So these apply, um, if you want to show TEDx Seven videos, uh, obviously down from off YouTube, but they have to do with everything from bullying to creativity to having an impact to climbing Mount Everest uh, to starting a charity. Um, and these students, the great thing is that they have these personal stories and they are incredibly intelligent and motivated. But then afterwards, I was chasing them around the cafeteria. Um, long story, but it's, it just shows that no matter what, you can still have fun and still play around and be serious at the same time. 
time uh, with other things and do great things. And I think that showing students doing good for your community doesn't have to be a really adult, serious thing. Mm -hmm. so. so.